This episode, what do a cholera outbreak and marketing have in common? When really is the best time to tweet? Archbishop Sheen is declared venerable by the Holy Father. We attempt to reboot your CCD program, and we learn about some resources in defending the Catholic faith. All this, our picks of the week, and probably a little bit more. Catholic Underground starts now. Well, hello there. It's time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 198. I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining me, as we always tend to have this time of year, it's kind of a seasonal thing, Father Ryan Humphreys joins us uh, from his perch there at the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary Catholic Church in North Central Louisiana. He's the associate chaplain for Radio Maria in these United States. Hello, Father. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even I don't even know what that was that was that all that was the whole salutation. Yeah, I was just giving you a little Ed McMahon hello world. I feel like it it made sense. My my head is so gigantic in the screen, you know, it's, <laughs> it's right true. up there in your face. Uh, you know, I, I really don't know what to do. So I feel like Ed and I feel like I need to channel my inner Ed and so that was what I got. Well, that's a, that's pretty good. We'll we'll uh we'll go for it. Anyway, um now marketing is not what it once was. Um, there once was a time where men drove huge Ford cars, <laughs> and, <laughs> and in that time, um, they they um, wrote for newspapers and they did all sorts of advertising uh, spreads and things like that. Nowadays, the way of marketing is the way of going viral. It's kind of like cholera. Yeah, it's 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 all about making sure that lots of people do your work for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, back in the day, you paid somebody, they put up a billboard, and that was as simple as it is. Nowadays you want more eyes and more engagement by making people, you know, interact with you in some way, shape or form. Um, and and this is cheaper to do too, isn't it? it, It's cheaper. And you know, it's astounding because it's, it's an entirely open field. So while the rules of marketing in the old school have been written since the days of the Mad Men TV show, you know, these new rules are completely out there. Um, the article we're looking at from Mashable has a couple of examples. The one that blows my mind, um, is, it's just astounding. It comes from Queensland, Australia, and local tourism authorities had 1.2 million Australian dollars, which isn't a fund, lot in the grand no, scheme of things. That's next to nothing to fund a global campaign. And yeah. so, what can you do? Well, you can buy maybe a thousand billboards, or mm-hmm. you can buy seven or eight minutes total of of TV time, you know, in a handful of markets, or you can think outside the box. And so, what they do is they run a classified ad around the world advertising a job for a, quote, island caretaker who basically comes to the comes to Australia, lives the good life, snorkeling, feeding fish, living it up in a dream cottage on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, and... and the, who all wouldn't like to, that? I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this is awesome. And so anybody who wants to be involved submits a video expressing why they want to get the job. And so with a budget of $1.2 million, they can set aside like 150 K for the salary of this job. And then basically just put ads, ads in the classifieds around the world. They get <laughs> 35,000 video submissions um, and, and are looking at one point at 4 million hits per hour, you yeah. know? And so this is, this is an advertising game that blows everybody away and it does it by not overspending. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's an entirely new idea for marketing and selling yourself. Yeah, and, that, and that's something. Is it's 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 one of those things that turned out. I don't. You think they actually spent one point two million dollars, maybe just in putting the ads in the papers? Uh, well, no. I mean, they they said that uh, they were able to set aside. I mean, a fairly significant amount of money. I'm I'm trying to see if I can find the the exact amount to as the salary for this person. I think it was like seventy five thousand dollars all said and done. So yeah, uh, and, for a six and, months uh, a six month but then job they also had to to rent the uh, the thing. Yeah, six month position. Blah blah blah. Um, but they said they did it in that budget and, you know, I mean, basically classified ads are cheap. That's pretty amazing. And, and you do those online classifieds and stuff like that. And it's pretty crazy. Yeah. They in the same Mashable article, they, uh, they talked about another cheap way to do things. Uh, the, the university of Wisconsin, Madison, um, basically went through a 24 hour period inviting their students to tweet and to submit photos 
uh, all about uh, what student life is like in a 24-hour period. And uh, sure enough, they had uh, over a thousand, I believe, uh, over a thousand people um, chime in with their hashtag, and they were able to then cultivate that. And it brought uh, quite a few subscribers. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of a uh, thousand submissions had been posted to the site, more than three thousand tweets, and uh, it basically created a, a desirable shareability, which is what you want in viral marketing. And so maybe they got a few more uh, people that went to the college uh, because of that. What a really cool idea. Again, you're, you're talking about putting, putting the, the burden of marketing not on the guys in Madison Avenue, but rather upon the people who submit it. Right. And, and, you know, that's one of the rules that in, in old marketing you did not do. You never. No, you always take, control the experience. That's right. You've right. got it. You've got it. And, and Apple still plays by those rules. You have to own every part of the experience. Yeah. You know, and so it proves that the old marketing days are not dead. Mm -hmm. You know, but the, but some of the rules are you don't you don't ever allow an amateur to make your content for you. You know, and you don't want, uh, you know, it's cute to have some kids color some sheets to raise money for muscular dystrophy. It's not to make cute to have them color sheets so that you can sell a Toyota Corolla. Right. Um, but, but that's but what's this, happening. This, that, right, this breaks all the rules. It says you make a video, whatever quality you want, you know, and tell us what to do. And you have everything from, you know, from, from women, you know, dressed in parkas, pulling off, you know, all their clothes and wearing a bikini saying, this is why it would be good for me to have this job, you know, to, to a guy who already lives there, you know, walking around saying, I already know how to do it and stuff like that. So you have everything on every end of the spectrum. Yeah. And, of course, they're telling people, come watch the videos. Watch what these people are saying. And it turns into this massive viral moment. I mean, four million hits an hour. Yeah, that's crazy. You can't pay for that. You can't pay for that kind of interaction. And so so, this is down. so uh, we're Catholic, um, so I'm told. <laughs> do we do something like this, and how do we do it? Well, you know, we saw something uh, akin to this when um, when there was a Eucharistic Congress going on and everybody was was being asked to make – uh, videos, you know, uh, to submit videos about love for the Eucharist. And we, and we covered some of those, I think, about six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's certainly that rule is fairly easy to get involved with. You know, but I, I think that the guys, the, the people, especially in Australia, have an interesting idea of reaching into the classifieds yeah. and kind of pulling people out who may not be as in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that's a, an area that's very interesting to me. Uh, and I think there's a lot of other very cool ideas about how to make something go viral. Um, you know, one of our, our listeners, David and I, were, were talking recently, and uh, the Rick Santorum campaign, mm -hmm. um, you know, didn't didn't uh, go out and ask for it, but a number of people posted videos talking about their excitement after Santorum had come through town, you know, and, and a, a couple of girls put together a video where they sang a song, wrote a song, mm -hmm. and it kind of became the unofficial campaign theme. Uh, you know, and you've got stuff like that where, if, if somebody's sitting in front of any laptop at all now, they can make a video. Yeah. So why aren't we asking people to submit videos? Because there's some really talented people out there That's right. who do crazy stuff with an iPhone or an iPad or, mm -hmm. or you know, God forbid, even a Dell. <laughs> well, and my question, too, is, is is this about just getting famous? Because it seems like everybody is, is submitting these uh, just, just to be famous, to get either 15 seconds of fame on YouTube or to, to strike at Bieber, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's and, a juggernaut you're not going to get in trouble. Of. That's exactly right. And, and so uh, as a Catholic, my motivation may not necessarily be to be famous, but it might be just to, to stake my claim in being uh, an evangelist in a sense. Yeah, I think if, if any time we do this as Catholics, it has to be for the purpose of we have to be glorifying God by trying to help with evangelization or by trying to explain something or, or like the, the voting video with the fire and, you know, the, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, where, where the conscious effort is to say we're inspiring Catholics to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if it was if it was we're looking for Catholics to buy into Catholic Mutual, you know, I, I, it's a different animal altogether, I think. But I, I, I do believe that that if you pray and you create something like this, very much like the way icons developed. Yeah. You know, I, I think you can you can end up having a similar procedure, mm -hmm. given that video is such an interesting form of media and that it's now really possible to do great stuff with it. Catholic Maneuth says, leave Dell alone. Ireland has enough trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, we'll, we'll make fun of HP instead. <laughs> pick, pick somebody else. That's right. Although isn't Packard a, an Irish name? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving that alone. Now, is there a critical mass of cash to pull something like this off? So, uh, to some degree, yeah. I mean, I mean you know, you, you, can't, you, you can't just expect to do it on $1.75. I mean, even 
even those great movies mm -hmm. uh you know that are that are low budget you need a hundred grand you know I, I think like congo yeah i i think you'd 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 if you were going to do something that was produced um you certainly need a critical mass of probably 50 to 60 grand mm -hmm. um you can occasionally get a viral video out there, but not on any kind of consistent basis Yeah. Uh, without the money to have good lighting, good computers, stuff like that. If you have great talent, that number is much lower. But, you know, I think <laughs> for example, no, nothing on Catholic Underground has ever gone viral ever. No, <laughs> except but maybe it, the times we get sick on the air. And but see, our format, though, is, is not really conducive to viral. Viral is is, is three, two, three, four minutes. Right. Uh, you know, and, and it's it's almost never talking heads. Right. You know, so, I mean, our format is not really. Conducive. Maybe if the ceiling fell while we were, you know, podcasting, that might well, I mean, be. But even even when Leo Laporte's ball exploded and he fell on the ground, it was hysterical. That really didn't go viral by any, no. any yeah, that's shape, true. may shape or form, you know. That's so. true. Now, now, Father, um, so basically we're, we're talking about breaking the old ad rules in favor of something new. And uh, and that seems to be working. Um, we talked a little bit about it before. What were some of the old ad rules that were broken? I mean, uh, so the, the first one was was controlling the experience from from um, inspiration to finish, the finish of the campaign. That that now no longer has to be done. That's right. It's certainly not on the paper anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there there are other ad rules about the fact that it, you should just you know when in doubt throw money at the problem. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've I, seen even with professional things that that doesn't work. Yeah, you know, I mean. It, we, and we know people who who may spend, you know, forty thousand dollars on a website or hand five thousand dollars to somebody to make a logo. Yeah. You know, in the other end, you get Microsoft Word art, you right. know. So, I mean, just throwing money at it is, is not necessarily that big of a deal. Um, I do think some old rat, old ad rules, though, have to stay. You have to have a quality product. Mm -hmm. You know, if these Australian people were proposing, you know, a, working at a, a, a water purification plant or a sewer plant. You know, I don't think I don't think they would have been True. able to make it go. Uh, yeah. You know, so there's some rules that stay, but I do think that that any rule that can go, mm -hmm. you know, I think has to be at least considered, you know, as breakable. And I think part of it is the value of of trusting your consumer too, trusting mm -hmm. the consumer to believe in the product that you're offering, and trusting the consumer to actually um, uh, express him or herself in some way that is authentic. And that's where I think, too, we, we end up in, in some of the Catholic uh, viewpoints there, namely that, that even in the sale and buying of products, it's person to person, ultimately. It is you nowadays. Know, that's, sure. what, that's what marketing should be about, about and not just, not just marketing stuff to make more money. Right. You know? I, I think, though, that one of, the interesting, or one of the things we have to keep in mind is it, there has to be a purpose. Mm -hmm. just, just going viral to go viral doesn't actually do anything. You know, um, unless you're seeking Rouge, fame, just plain well, old I mean, fame. If you, if you just want, you just want your moment in the sun. I mean, like Baton Rouge newspapers were having a cutest baby competition, mm -hmm. you know, and it was cute, but they never actually got around to driving anybody to buy subscriptions to their paper. Right. And so, you know, it was, it was just basically a big screaming match over whose baby is cuter. Right. And, and none of that actually. Yeah. Flash in the pan anything. type of thing. Exactly. You know, and, and so in a certain sense, even Catholics need to be aware we actually want to accomplish something. Yeah. You know, we don't just want to make sure a lot of people submit something. You know, we want it to have some kind of standard of this is what we're looking for. Right, exactly. Now, now con continuing with that marketing thing, uh, apparently there is a right time to tweet and a right time to be retweeted. <laughs> <laughs> turn, turn, turn. <laughs> and the time apparently is when people have a lot of stuff going on. This, this kind of, I, I, I don't understand why that works, but I guess people are more willing to be distracted. Is that what it is? Uh, you know, I don't know, but I, it's according to this is another Mashable article. The, the sense is people have time to follow your links. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you tweet somebody on Monday morning at nine, that's when all the emails getting checked, and you're not going to click through. But if you tweet somebody on Sunday midday, they're already back from church or they've finished lunch, you know, and, and they've got nothing but to do the afternoon. And so, you know, why not follow that link to this or why not, you know, click on that and find out what's going on? And remember, the purpose of Twitter, you know, when you're thinking about it from a marketing point of view is interaction. Mm -hmm. You right. want people to click on that link, not just to be am am amused by the fact that you made a funny, um, you know, and if you're not going to do it on the weekend, then you want to tweet during work hours. The worst time you can do it is a weekday after hour outside of work hours. Um, 
and I, I think too the thing that, that this article points out is you don't want to tweet too often. You know, yeah. we've all been in, it followed people who are tweeting 13, 14, 20 times a day. It's yeah, just I, never. Uh, yeah, the, after a while, either you mute them or you just stop checking. Yeah, I just, I, I just unfollow feed. them. You know, I mean, it, it, the, <laughs> or if you're Father Ryan, you just nuke them. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the sweet spot is one to four tweets per day. And that's, that's actually what I would have guessed before I read the article. Mm -hmm. um, and oddly enough, uh, shorter tweets are preferred. So yeah, you have 140 characters to tweet, but but even if you can keep it short, that's actually a preference. And that makes sense because if you're going to reply or put neat or cool or I don't agree or you're a jerk or that's right or fantastic, you need a handful of characters to let somebody reply to you. Right. Yeah, that, that makes that makes good sense. Um, <laughs> it's just good just, sense. That's just don't good change. tweet What's sense. That's right. <laughs> and so hashtags actually help too. Um, hashtags are those things whenever you have something pounded. Um, like, uh, like our hashtag oh. is, <laughs> our hashtag is pound C U cast. And so apparently this actually helps as well. If, if there, if there, um, there's some sort of hashtag so that you can trend and then people, they can interact that way. Yeah. It, yeah. I think that, that, that makes it, it, it makes a lot of sense because one, it makes people feel like you're in the know. Mm -hmm. And two, it, it makes sense because there's a lot of apps out there, Twitter apps that you follow by hashtag. You know, like yeah. I have a search set up on mine for a hashtag CU cast. Anytime some, anybody tweets that, immediately I'm involved, and I'm very, very likely to click those links. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's that's good to know um, because we probably haven't been doing that with, <laughs> with our tweeting from the Gathic Underground. Tweeting so hopefully that's helpful to you. I mean, you, you may have tuned into the podcast and going, okay, they're talking about this an awful lot, but this is actually a way to begin to engage an audience. This is a way to engage those who, um, who perhaps – are trying to figure out how to get onto the digital continent, but but maybe you're just trying to figure out how, you know, what what's what's going on, how's how, how's to do it, um, and so that. that's right, exactly. And uh, somebody who I think would have used Twitter had he been alive uh, at the time of its inception, Archbishop Sheen. Here, here. I have he a feeling he'd have been on top of uh, of social media. Yes, without any doubt. That's right. Now, good news coming out of Peoria, Illinois, and Rome. Um, Archbishop Sheen is done with all of his sainthood paperwork, and boy, he's <laughs> been for you. burning the midnight oil to uh, to get it done. Now, the Roman Curia announced on Thursday that the only thing that remains for Archbishop Sheen to be elevated to uh, to the rank of of the altars is um is the proving the certification of his miracles, and uh, that is a really beautiful thing. I know um in the the last few times I've been able to go to Rome, I visited with Monsignor uh, Richard Sozman who is on uh, the Archbishop Sheen uh, cause, and he and just about everybody on the, the panel are very, very excited, and I'll bet they're beside themselves now that Archbishop Sheen can now be called the Venerable Archbishop right. Fulton Sheen. It's, it's uh, you know, Bishop Sheen is, um, already has a miracle in, in the pipe. In works, yeah, in the works. Yeah, and, and it's, it's being investigated, and there are several others down the line already, you know, so this is really, really excellent news. We're looking maybe maybe as, as short as eight to ten months. You know, probably though within within two years we'll be talking about blessed, maybe even uh, Saint Fulton mm -hmm. Sheen, which was great for everybody working in new media. Yeah. But it's also exciting for Americans, mm -hmm. um, you know, because he's such a well known saint. Yeah. And of course there's there's some other fun drama points too that I won't get into now, but that are pretty exciting about it as well. Yeah, w Father, w would you like to to plan a trip to go for his uh, his beatification or canonization? If it's if the canonization, I'd go for. I just just got back from Europe, so I don't want to go anytime. Yeah, but, but, by the time it comes around, yeah. But no, I, would I think that would be outstanding go. if we can if we can make it happen. Oh yeah, yeah, I think it'd be a beautiful thing. I know. Um, I've been reading the uh, autobiography of Archbishop Sheen. And mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I'm amazed at how much the Lord was able to do through him. Now, of course, he writes in a, in a rather kind of boisterous, prideful manner. He's very proud of the work that he does. But one of the things that I get more than anything as I'm reading the book is that he himself is, is both astonished and not surprised at all about the things that the Lord can do. You it's know? true. I, I, love, I love to read his style. Yeah, he, he, has a, he has a very sure style of speaking. And it's almost as if he's blown away, but at the same time saying, well, why wouldn't God do this? Why shouldn't he do that? You know, <laughs> um, and, and uh, I, I remember um, one of the stories where he's just talking about how he prepares for television. And uh, the way that he would prepare is that he would write everything out. He would write it again. 
he would write it and write it and write it, and then he would write it in a different language. He would give the presentation in two different languages to a professor of that language. And the reason that he did this was to uh, kind of, uh, as he would say, he, to, to wed himself um, to the material. And so by the time he got on television, I think 16 hours of preparation for one hour had passed. Right. And he was ready. He, he could go in and out. He could talk about it till he was blue in the face. And, uh, of course, he never quite got blue in the face, but, um, <laughs> but he certainly did, uh, he did know the material that he was presenting. And, uh, you I'm, know, I'm, so many people beautiful. think he was just, just yammering, just talking off the top of his head. And it seemed, you know, so It was effortless. Flowing. It seemed that but, way. But like you say, I mean, this the stuff is brilliant. And if you ever read the book form of, of Life is Worth Living, the insights and the study and the depth of his, his talks are just insane. You know, I mean, I've read those over and over and over again. And, you know, as much as it seems natural, I don't know there's a person in this country who could write one of those talks in a month. Right. Just just the depth of that man's knowledge is yeah, crazy. It's very true. So we're very, very excited uh, about uh, about Archbishop Sheen. And, of course, he continues to remain an intercessor for us uh, at the Catholic Underground. And, of course, I actually invoke him before I preach. Um, so there may have been some more miracles that uh, that have not yet been published uh, that that I haven't put all of my congregations to sleep. Um, but also, if if you'd like to uh, to learn more about um, an homage to Archbishop Sheen, uh, I'd recommend that you go over to the Catholic Underground uh, website at catholicunderground.com and check out Father Ryan's show, Life Is Still Worth Living, where uh, he tries to uh, in a Sheeny style. Um, present some of the issues in our faith today. So nowhere near as good. I solemnly assure you. Well, that's all right. That's okay. That's all right. At least we're we're continuing. We're taking up that work. You know. Yeah. If you stayed up late or got up early to watch the famed Pallium Mass on the feasts of Saints Peter and Paul, where the new archbishops receive their symbols of office, you may have noticed something different. According to the Holy See Press Office, the Holy Father approved a modification of the ritual itself of the rite. Um, quote: Following a logic of development and continuity. It has been decided simply to move the rite itself, and it will now take place before the Eucharistic celebration. And so basically the, the rite of calling the names of the archbishops to receive their pallium and the giving over, the investiture with the pallium, happens before the Mass begins. And uh, the press office, the Holy See, said that it's, it's done to make the rite shorter, so the names are read before Mass, um, and it's to ensure that the Eucharistic celebration is not interrupted by a relatively long rite. Uh, right now, about 45 archbishops receive the pallium each year. And it says, quote, which could make attentive and focused participation in the Mass more difficult, unquote. Uh, to keep the ritual faithful itself uh, more in line with the ceremonial of bishops and to avoid the possibility that by coming after the homily, as has happened in the past, it might be thought of as a sacramental rite. Indeed, the rites which take place during a Eucharistic celebration following the homily are normally sacramental, like baptism, confirmation, ordination, matrimony, or anointing of the sick. The imposition of the pallium, on the other hand, is not sacramental in nature. And so I think, personally, that this is just showing the Pope's commitment um, to a continuing organic organization and restoration of the liturgy. And there's also an important pastoral consideration at work there, too. We don't want to make it insatiably long, and we also want to keep it uh, in line with what the mass is supposed to do in the first place, you know. My yeah, question, I'm, uh, Father, is uh, might this reordering of a non-sacramental rite begin to reflect upon all the extracurriculars that take place after the homily in so many parishes, or will it just be ignored? Certainly, a lot of people will ignore it. Um, I think that the the larger question is not just whether it pulls non-sacramental stuff out from after the sermon, because really, there's not that much of that. Um, you know, I mean, other than I think a handful of nonsense, like, okay, we're going to fill out our NPU solicitation for the bishop's appeal. Um, you know, I don't think there's a ton of that, but my real question is, what is this going to, to do when, when we start thinking about weddings, mm -hmm. which in the extraordinary form take place prior to the mass, mm -hmm. uh, baptisms, which take place prior to the mass, uh, even confirmations. Yeah. Uh, which which often in the in the past took place prior to the mass. Well, because all the sacraments um, themselves can stand on their own. That's right. Yeah. And and the traditional way this worked, and I was discussing this with a friend recently, is you know the wedding would for for a wedding the bride would come in and it would be very dramatic and very beautiful and and whatever music she wanted it doesn't matter if she wanted you know Van Halen it really didn't matter 
<laughs> she came in and and it was it was uh you know it, it was a ceremony not not necessarily a liturgy it was although you could make discussion and the priest would vest and cope and he would do the wedding ceremony he would begin preaching that's where we get that dearly beloved that was so common to everybody's experience mm -hmm. um and and he would do and they would marry him up and get everybody ready and then he would go back to the chair and then switch into the chasm and then start mass and so there was the wedding ceremony and then there was mass and you can still do that in the extraordinary form. Uh -huh. And my question is whether this becomes a starting point for doing that in the ordinary form as well. Because if you have a wedding or a baptism, especially if you have multiple baptisms, it's not unusual for there to be 20, 30 minutes between the gospel yeah. and the creed. Yeah. And that's just not okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I love this. It's very, very exciting. But my my question is not just the next step. It's, it's the, the chess kind of pope. Is you know he just moved his his rook, but what's he thinking about doing with that you know that bishop? No pun intended. <laughs> four moves down the road. Yeah. And uh, and for my money, that that is is a gigantic opportunity for the church to 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 stop that stuff, even the good stuff that has been artificially jammed in the middle of the mass. The mass isn't an Oreo, and this is yeah. the Pope kind of reminding us: you don't just stick good stuff between two edges, you know, and and have it be okay because the mass is the mass, and we love the mass. Right, and and those are some of the things that that I think about. And and uh, Al Noga fifteen in the chat room uh, uh, notes, "What about the Easter Vigil?" And the Easter Vigil is a, a very good example of uh, of a rather large sandwich cookie, where there's a lot taking place um, within that liturgy. Right, there there's a lot that that takes place within it. But it should be noted that it's intended to be a vigil. Yeah, and and not formally speaking a mass, even though it, the Eucharist the Eucharistic celebration does take place. Their, you know, liturgical experts will 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 point out their their distinctions, mm -hmm. um, and that all those ceremonies and rituals prior to the mass don't and don't get in the middle of the way the integrity of the mass, um, the way that that something like inserting a wedding into the middle of the mass does. Mm -hmm. But there's there that becomes incredibly complicated theology. But it's it's the kind of stuff I'd love to start discussing and yeah. start thinking about. Uh, and the Pope is allowing that discussion to take place. Um, and, and a lot of what he's done as Pope is allow discussions to take place. And I think it's very exciting. Yeah. And, and I have to say, as a priest, uh, sometimes there can be a bit of a disconnect between the end of the Liturgy of the Word and the beginning of the Liturgy of the Eucharist whenever there's a lot going on in, in the middle. Um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but, but I can say that just personally, uh, I can begin to feel a disconnect whenever it feels like I'm trying to, to place uh, emphasis on, on just way too much in one Eucharistic celebration. And then what ends up happening, inevitably, uh, I, I never, I've never done this and I never will, um, but the temptation can become, well, maybe I should use Eucharistic prayer too, because, you know, mm, you know, um, may that never happen. And, and I always make sure that if something takes a little bit extra long before the, the liturgy of the Eucharist begins, I will almost always purposefully use a longer Eucharistic prayer to remind yeah. myself that this this is is why we are here. We are here for the the integrated mass, the whole thing, you know, not just one or the other uh, bit and piece of it. So anyway, end of end of homily. But I think it's a beautiful thing. the uh, The pallium mass was wonderful. In fact, um, we'll put a link in our show notes uh, to to uh, either part of it or the giving of the palliums. The Vatican has a really good channel on YouTube, so we'll put that in the show notes as well. All right, Father Richard Simon, who runs the Father Know It All blog had a rant, which he has since removed from his blog about the state of Catholic education. And Father Z, of course, has quoted uh, part of it for posterity. I read this, uh, and, and I found it very interesting because he does seem to, uh, to say very well part of the problem with, with uh, Catholic education, with CCD, with uh, paraschools of religion, uh, namely that um, CCD was developed a, a long time ago for a kind of a different model of Catholicism and one that had the family unit really at its core. Yeah. And, and uh, that's not there anymore. No, I, I don't think any of us could pretend that most of the kids coming into a CCD program or those coming into Catholic school, for that matter, uh, are getting the real experience of prayer, um, of, of family support, of family religious study. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I doubt any of our Catholic families, you know, are, are, are very, very few are really having any kind of serious discussions with their kids about this is who Jesus is. And this I would is hope what prayer are. means. And I, I think that some yeah. some are doing something. Um, 
but I, I think a lot of the fault for that lies on the shoulders of the church, who is not saying, Catholic parents, here's concretely what you ought to be doing. You know, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about the unitive and the procreative ends of marriage, um, you know, and we've, and we've talked about NFP a lot, but we've not given kind of a checklist of what a Catholic family ought to be doing. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think Father Simon, you know, is covering a lot of ground but is basically saying it's time to rethink CCD from the ground up. Yeah. Um, now, now he he kind of espoused something that was was rather radical, huh? He, I think he, in his rant he was going to shut down uh, his CCD program and basically let people come to him whenever they were ready. Uh, yeah. And was, it, it, I I kind of read this and I didn't know if he was joking or not about some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, if he was just so mad. And, right. It, it seemed to come from a place of uh, of great frustration. Uh, which is probably why he took it down from from furious anger. That's right, um, but but basically the idea is that when we come to CCD, we get theology and not faith. Right. Right. That that faith comes uh, from from the family unit. It comes from being uh, rooted in prayer within the family, and then that is taken to the church, and the church nurtures it and helps it to grow. At least I believe that's the the, the whole point of the thing. Did, yeah, that's I, the basic premise. I mean, the 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 way I would describe it is that, you know, everybody at some point needs to experience conversion. You know, yeah. which is it's a little bit of a hippy dippy way of describing it, but it's it's easy and well, most people understand it. You need to acknowledge your own sinfulness. You need to experience divine mercy. You need to have the how of faith. Yeah. what we could describe as mystagogia. The this is how you pray. This is how you attend mass. This is how you make a confession. Right, like how you um, say to your your one or your two year old, okay, now let's kneel down in front of the bed. We put mm-hmm. our hands together and we make the sign of the cross. Those are the beginnings of mystagogia, right? That's right. That's 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 foundational material. It's not what you're not explaining the circumlocutions of the tetragrammaton to your child. You're but you are telling this is how you must do. You know, this is how you practice the mm-hmm. faith. Mm-hmm. And and it needs yeah. to be very how and not very what and not very why. Yeah. Then after you've kind of a, begun that process, there starts to be, and you've experienced it, Father, as I have, that desire to know more. Sure. And as that hunger develops, I think that's what Father was trying to articulate. Then that's when the people themselves start saying, I want to understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, and, and that's when catechesis begins. Yeah where you say, okay, here's Bible history, right. here's, here's the foundation of making a Christian decision, the three-font principle. That stuff has a place, but it doesn't belong um, in, in, the, in the textbook of somebody who kind of says, eh, I don't really care about God, but my mom made me be here. Right. Um, and, and I, but at the same time, I don't think we can simply say, well, you know, then that's the, it's the family's fault and just cop out. Mm-hmm. I think we have to reconsider CCD, yeah. as we're going to do in my parish, and we started talking about it, where those steps of of uh, acknowledging sin, seeking divine mercy, mystagogia, catechesis, and then ultimately the fifth step of vocation, how do I live this out every day of my life, those are going to become the guiding principles of our CCD program. And we want to go over and over and over and over and over again those things so that we're in a position um, to, to have that kid begin to know and love and serve God, uh, as opposed to, you know, simply saying, well, you don't have your stuff together, but you still have to learn this if you want to get confirmed. We, we know that it's not going to work with every kid, yeah. but how many CCD programs are getting better than 40 or 50% retention? I mean, well, that's right. not yeah. many, and that's not an okay number. No, certainly not, not for the future of the church and not for the present of the church either. Uh, and, and that's the thing I was talking, and this is something that I often harp on, is we tended to throw the baby out with, with the bathwater, right? Um, the, the Baltimore Catechism after, uh, well, I guess it was probably in the 70s, was seen as something that was old and outdated, and it didn't provide a why to the faith. Huh? It provided a what. You know, who loves me? Who, who made me? God made me, you know? Yeah. Um, why did God make me to know to love to serve him? Uh, so that I can be happy with him in this life and prepare for life with him in the next, right? It, that that gives you a what? And then, of course, in 1991, we got the Catholic Catechism. We got the Catechism of the United uh, the, the, the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church in the U.S. and all points in between. And right. and then all of a sudden, we had a beautiful two tiered system where you have uh, the very basic stuff, and then hopefully you would have uh, a way to to begin to inform 
uh, the question and answer. And I remember yeah. I was talking to someone. It, the kids are hardwired for memorization, which is why if you teach them a language when they're very young, they can retain it. They can learn it. It's the same thing with the language of the church. Nowadays, I mean, I didn't grow up with the Baltimore Catechism. And so now that I'm 31 years old and I, I want to remember all of the fruits of the Spirit, I can't do it. I have to right. it, go back and back and back again, and I'm, I'm trying to, to relearn something. I should be at the point now as a 31-year-old man to say, these are the fruits of the Spirit, blah, 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 and here's what they do. Because I went through catechism, because it was upheld within my family unit, and, and I know it. I'm wed to it, like Archbishop Sheen, the venerable, said. Huh? Mm. And, and I wonder if we can, if we can re- redo that, huh? if we can rediscover that. Because if you throw out the baby with the bathwater, well, I mean, you're, you're going to get a dirty baby. Right. I mean, and, and frankly, at this point, I think we can say that for the most part, CCD is so broken that there's not all that much to throw out. You know, you mm. get rid of the cute little orange book with the kid pushing the old lady on the front. And, you know, we're in a wheelchair in a wheelchair. Yeah, she's in a wheelchair, obviously <laughs> not pushing her out down the street or anything. Um, but but I mean, you know, you have the only the only kind of exception that rule you have some of the life teen model where sure. you, ha- you know, and and I think that's got some of the aspects we talked about, but it doesn't have it in any kind of systematic way. Mm. And it doesn't really, you know, it, even people experimenting with it can't say that it's working uh, for younger kids. You know, I've, I've been in parishes where we tried to life teen the elementary school and it just doesn't work. Even the junior not where they high, are. Yeah, I mean, the junior high, you're still, you know, they're, they're not ready intellectually to do that, to that I, I am my own person, and I, with my own person, am making this choice. Mm-hmm. They're just not there yet, mature, maturity-wise. Um, and it could be argued that high schoolers are not 100% there either. Yeah. And so I think that, 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 that taking these principles, you're going to apply them differently in different parishes with different mentalities. Mm-hmm. But I think those five principles, those five steps, you have to go through those um, and, and I, I think that the systematization of that yeah. is going to mean everything through eighth grade. Of course, I'm a big advocate of confirming an eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And then after that, you know, you have a wide variety of options. When you're trying to use life teen for confirmation prep, yeah, you get what you experienced. I don't know the Ten Commandments in order. You right. know, I mean, I, I didn't know them in seminary. And the only reason I know them in order is because I've been hearing confession for the last seven years. That's right. You've got uh, to know, you know them. Yeah. And, and, and I can say without any doubt whatsoever, Life Teen is insufficient as a sacramental prep tool, mm-hmm. but it's incredibly valuable in doing a lot of those other things. And so there has to be a systematization at yeah. the same time that there needs to be that sense of, of connection and involvement. Right. And, um, you know, so, so there's not anything out there right the second that works. But I think we can, if, if we come at it from the right philosophy, then we can start thinking about it better. And I don't, I don't think anyone's going to have an answer in the next three days or the next three years. Right. But, but we have to start talking about it because CCD, the confraternity of Christian doctrine, is dead. It, it does not make sense in the modern world. Yeah, of course, we don't even use, uh, by and large, that, that distinction anymore. We don't call it CCD because right. nobody knows what it means. So we call it PSR right. or some other acronym. Uh, can yeah. tech help in this? Does tech have a yeah, part to play? You know, Life Teen is a good example. Tech can absolutely work. Videos, um, videos have proven to be astoundingly helpful. The Life Teen videos made for the new translation of the Roman Missal. Oh, they're very good. Yeah, they're very were, good. They were, they were insane. I mean, they were so good. Um, and, and there are other videos out there. Of course, we talked about this, um, you know, at last year's Catholicon. We talked about, about ways that you can use that to help with mystagogy, ways you can use that to help reveal divine mercy. We've seen some of these these viral videos like you were talking about earlier that are just amazing, and uh, and and if we think about where they go, it's, it's like a hat rack. You want to know where to hang your hat for each of those categories. We can start to put together some incredibly good videos that don't have to go through, you know, Ignatius Press or through, sadly, or God help us all, or you know, we don't have to work through a company. Um, we can just create something good. Now, you do have companies that are producing good stuff, Magis and. Um, and and Ignatius that are doing good programs, good videos. I do believe that the days of of the textbook may be on their way out. I mm-hmm. think that we can do better. I think an, an iPad CCD program uh, would right now would become amazing. Yeah, I, I think that would be great. In fact, that's that's something I would just love to see. 
um, yeah. an interactive iPad uh, type situation. I, I would I would love to see that. Uh, I'd love to write it actually. <laughs> you know, yeah. but uh, well, that uh, may, maybe that isn't for me to do uh, with two parishes and whatnot. But but you <laughs> you no no you right there. Um, why don't why do you think about it? Maybe the Lord's calling you to do it. Let us know at backchat at catholicunderground.com if uh, it's something you're interested in. Uh, let's see. We, we move on. This is all connected. Father Tim Finnegan over at the Hermeneutic of Continuity blog um, has a great post of random resources for answering hard questions about the faith. And the beautiful thing about the Internet is some of this stuff can be retooled and reused and even perhaps made into the beginnings, the nascent stages of an iPad textbook. You know? it's, it's very true. It's a great idea. Yeah. And so, um, let's see, he says, uh, a lot of blo bloggers and podcasters forget that everyone doesn't just have a list like this at the tip of their brain, and so he provides it. So what are some of the things, Father, that, that he recommends? You've got the catechism, of course. Yeah, you have, you have your, your news zones. You have news.va, catholicanswers.org, the catechism of the Catholic Church, the new online catechism. We talked about that last the week. catechism yep. Blah, blah. Um, <laughs> it's a silly there's name. also he also recommends uh, a number of of excellent blogs like Father Z, um, a, a couple of of books. Of course, remember books are are infinitely cheaper now mm -hmm. with ebooks and things like Chesterton and Newman and Peter. Some Kreef, of them are a lot free. Of those. Yeah, some of those are, are free and in the open domain. Uh, you also have the works of people like Pam Stenzel and Janet Smith on sex and chastity. Uh, you have Father Robert Barron's amazing video series, but also his books and his blog, The Catholic Truth Society, which has little short pamphlet-type things. Um, he recommends some modern authors I've never heard of, Corin and Pernod. Oh, yeah, uh, Michael Corrin. I have heard of good. Michael Corrin. Uh, I always think of the under uh, the Underworld series. <laughs> it's a different or, Yeah, it's a different Michael Corrin. He's not a lichen. Yes, uh, but uh, Michael uh, Corrin and Pernod. Um, and then there's also in another post that he links to, uh, a need to to be aware that if we're going to do sharing of our faith, if we're going to create and share resources, mm -hmm. that we should know the audience yeah. and the context and the principles of the answer. Um, and so, like, if somebody comes to me and they say, oh, I want to understand, let's say, why the Crusades happened. Well, it's not really a smart move to give them a 4,000-page history of Christianity. <laughs> Here, read this. Hell. <laughs> yeah, it makes a heck of a lot more sense to give them a, a short pamphlet or a link to a website, um, you know, and, and knowing that makes so much difference. Also being able to recognize this is just somebody who's trolling and they just want to, to anger me or be frustrated and they don't care what I'm going to say. Yeah. Knowing that makes a big difference, whether you're doing it going online or in real life. Right. So, so basically to, to try and recognize that uh, that sometimes you just you've just got people that are that are going to be after you but even those people you can have a few little bullet points to kind of test them out you know to kind of see yeah. what their intentions are and then go a little bit deeper if you need to and and knowing your audience it's like we were talking about with uh, with CCD uh, you can't give somebody solid food if they're not even at the milk or the water stage yet yeah you know <laughs> uh, so that's very important um, kind of connecting that as well, uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, that old chestnut, uh, has issued 10 rules for social media and evangelization. That old chestnut. <laughs> and so. <laughs> yeah, they've been back again. Uh, <laughs> in in no know. particular, but they're actually, yeah. you can break down yeah, some I mean, of them. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, some of them have some value. I mean, this this is Lassie running to the well for the 800th time, but <laughs> let's go He's through still them, down there. He's still He's down there. <laughs> Timmy's still down there. He's broken his shoulder this time. <laughs> It's always something with that boy. Number one is to translate church. To, we're going to fill the well in. The well, right. we're, we're getting Britta. Huh? It's, a big, gonna... it's a big well. Put a ladder down there. I mean, the dog can carry a ladder. Just give him a ladder. <laughs> Number one, translate church teaching. So basically boil it down, I guess, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, avoid church speak. Blah. So Right. Uh, and, and I'm guessing that means um, you don't use the word chancel whenever you mean <laughs> <laughs> don't use sacristy when you mean stuff room that was the most random non sequitur ever of all time it was outstanding you're welcome it's, you're welcome it, america jesus hung upon a gibbet that's right <laughs> yeah, that's right that's right uh, you yeah, can use but, a soft but, g optional yeah clearly talking about talking about church speak not not talking about transubstantiation or things that they're clearly not going to understand right you know, at, at yeah. first glance uh, use images as Jesus did. 
which is, I mean, this is part of the, the new evangelization, right? Uh, yeah. Being able to, to speak in, in kind of a parabolic way, to be able to use images that, that relate. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, to understand that social media is, in fact, social. Social. <laughs> yeah, that, that you're not just speaking into a void, but that there are actually other people that are reading what you're writing or, uh, or what you're blogging or, or podcasting. Um, yeah. And number five, y- you'll love this one, Father. Social media sometimes calls for a suit of armor. <laughs> Better get on eBay and pick one up. <laughs> right. Got nothing. Two thousand dollars. Two thousand dollars U.S. plus ship. It's eight hundred pounds of solid beat <laughs> iron. No problem. <laughs> I think what they mean though is that sometimes you got to have your guard up, right? Some thick skin. Yeah, I yeah, think that's what yeah, they're shooting yeah. for. Yeah. Number six, uh, <laughs> use the delete button if comments cross the line of decency, but hopefully not often. So let people speak their piece, um, but uh, but don't be afraid if you're the guy who's in charge of the blog to, to say, okay, Father Z is very good about this, by the way. Yeah, he really if, if things uh, kind of uh, detract or if they go into animalistic territory where cannibals <laughs> are starting to feast on the, the, the phrases of others, uh, you just say, oh, no, no, banned, delete. Yep. Um, number seven, spread Catholicism's fun parts. <laughs> Yeah, let's move right. on. <laughs> uh, number eight, remember, rules, they are a-changing. Uh, I'm not sure what this is about. <laughs> the, the rules of the rules of social media are always involved. Oh, right, of course. I, think uh, they're, I, I guess it's, I mean, I don't I don't have insight into her brain. Right. If I did, I would have changed this list. But, <laughs> <laughs> but number, anyway. number nine, remember, web messages live forever. <laughs> <laughs> and so do bacteria in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> That's right. And number ten. Keep it short, Sally. <laughs> I'm six two. I, I don't. <laughs> That's right. No matter what you. Yeah. So yeah. so basically, be brief. Be yeah. Brief I mean, you know, yeah. It, it, it. This this list is is suitable for MySpace. Uh, you know, I mean, it 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 feels so so dated. You know, I mean, avoid church speak. You know, and spread Catholicism's fun parts. You know that that that. It just feels like you're under underestimating who you're talking to. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, I, I guess this kind of thing may work if you are really absolutely a newbie in social media. You have no experience of it, and you just decided tomorrow, I'm going to get on Facebook and Twitter and MySpace. and I'm going to tweet plurk, space and you know, face. And I'm going I'm I'm to get on there and plurk up, and, and we're going to have a time. Um, but I think anybody who you know who has more than seven Facebook friends is looking up and going, yeah. Yeah, number 11, bake a cake, invite everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Put on the teapot because you're going to have a Google conversation or something. <laughs> I'll put on a tea. I'm going to have a hangout that these young children are speaking. I'll of. put on tea. <laughs> Sorry, USCCB. Uh, we're not making fun of you. I am. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are some. There's some good things there. That, no, there's that, some. That, there's some very good things in that list. You know, the notion of translation is a great analogy. Absolutely, we've got to. We try um, to do that on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, the, the teaching of the church obviously is complex, it's nuanced, it has to be, and so translating that is a really good way to think about it. You know, if, if, if I speak French and I'm going to go talk, try to minister to somebody who speaks German, at some point I'm going to have to learn how to speak that language and then translate my ideas into that language. Right. Uh, certainly the idea about using the delete button sparingly, but when it's necessary is good. Uh, remembering that the rules are always evolving, I wish they would have remembered that before they wrote this post, but... Uh, but that's definitely a good one as well. And and frankly, remembering that anything on the web is always on the web. Yeah. They're, good they're, to remember. That's very true. Um, of course, uh, we'd also recommend a few of them, right? Uh, a few things. Um, go in prepared, right? When, when yeah. we do this podcast, we try. <laughs> we try to make sure that we're prepared. Um, you got to know the material. You got to know the argument because a lot of the a lot of the arguments that that those who don't know the faith uh, or who are just learning are going to bring. Are ones that that are that are just general logical fallacies that have to be corrected. And if you know that argument, then you can engage it properly. Absolutely. You know, it, it's funny that a lot of the the questions that people have about the faith uh, aren't new questions. There's not right. really, um, you know, and a lot of it, of course, is 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 socially charged. Some of the questions that they have come from society who posits one thing or another. That's just a restating of an old heresy. So if you know that argument then you can engage it and you can you can engage it with love um, you yeah. also want to make sure that you you have more information ready so have a big link list uh, in your bookmarks if you're if you're talking on the web or do, engaging in social media saying yeah go here go to this visit that podcast uh, read this 
Um, yeah, and, and with that, I mean, know that there's other people out there who are doing a lot of that work for you already. Yes, that's right. There are great apologetics websites. There are infographics and YouTube. Uh, if you know how to search it and you work for it, you can find 99% of the material you need to share yeah. right there. Right. And, and you have to vet it. You have to look through it. But, I mean, yeah. that's a great place to fill up a toolbox with information. You know, but don't feel like you need to go whip out your catechism and try to figure out, you know, how do we defeat atheism as a as a, a discussion? Well, God, go to a website. People know what they're talking about. These people, you know, those 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 resources are there. So that would definitely be one I would add. Right. There's some know, people look, who look almost do this for a living. You know. Yeah, they really do. Uh, let's see. Don't don't engage trolls. Right. There are always going to be people yeah. that are trying just to pick a fight. Don't don't even you know, just delete. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. The big picture, of course, why am I here? Why am I in this discussion? Am I trying to convert a person? Then what's the plan for that? Or am I just kind of going for the jugular because I have information and I've got to use it? You know? Right. I, I think a lot of people on Facebook will find a quotation or something and just throw it out there. And then you have some, uh, some jerk who comes back and, and you have the opportunity to say, okay, I want to actually respond to this person. Right. Um, but you've got to you got to say what what am I what's my plan? Am I actually going to try to convert this person or change their mind? Yeah. Or am I basically going to end up being a troll, just yeah. firing back at them just to cut them? And right. There's no real virtue in that. Sure. Then of course uh, to to focus right. Don't swerve off into politics or or other things that don't have anything to do with what you're discussing. In fact, this happened last weekend. I was saying mass in Guelph, in Ontario. Say that name thrice. <laughs> Guelph, Guelph. <laughs> <laughs> it's hyphenated when you say it twice. Um, <laughs> anyway, and and I was speaking about religious freedom because it was Canada Day, uh, July first, and oh, July fourth. That's right, and uh, and July fourth was coming up, and so I talked a little bit about the Health and Human Services mandate and things like that. And after mass, someone came up to me and says, "Well, Father, since you mentioned politics, I said, uh, no, I, I didn't mention politics. I mentioned morality. They're two very different things." And so when we're having discussions online, we need to make sure that we're, we're not crossing the line into politics, um, but that we're actually speaking about the issue. We're talking about the moral issue or, or the apologetic issue or the issue of faith and not starting to support candidates or things like that because the truth stands on its own. Well, and, and too, the same, the same notion of focus is that a lot of weak minds mm -hmm. um, are going to, as soon as they realize their particular bullet point won't hold up, they'll just hop to something else. Right. And then they'll hop to something else and they'll hop to something else. And if you can maintain focus and say, no, no, let's come back to that point you were making. You were saying that the church is somehow harboring pedophiles. Let's talk about that. Right. Let's not hop over and talk about making fun of nuns. We'll get there. Right. But if you, if you focus and don't get pulled off task, yeah. it becomes very, very easy to make good points. But if right. you just let somebody else bobble you around or say, did you see that movie with what's her name in it? Mm -hmm. You're never going to do anything good. You're just going to get into a bunch of random arguments yeah. And you're going to look the fool at the end and not glorify God. That's right. Connected to that is to think about the quality of your posts and quam, com, and comments and the quantity. Think about the quality. Uh, and then, you know, don't post too, too often. Don't just kind of keep going back to it. Uh, make sure, again, in the keep it short, Sally, uh, make sure that you're, you're concise in what you're saying and, and that you don't have to just keep going back. It's kind of like being Twitter spam. Yeah. You, you, yeah, I think that that's that's a gigantic problem. Is you'll have people who, who who want to get into these great discussions, mm -hmm. but they'll have nineteen of them happening at the same time. Right. You know, and and you just can't. You got You got to be focused on on good content, and and do enough posts to be involved, but not so many that people are overwhelmed or right. that you are overwhelmed. Exactly. Uh, also connected to that, choose the right medium, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. They each have their own. Uh, their own blessings and curses, their own positives and negatives in terms of getting information across. Um, don't try and get into a real deep discussion on Twitter and don't expect your Facebook posts to go viral and don't expect YouTube to do that either. You know, uh, Ultimately, right. even though some of these are, are real time in terms of, uh, of discussion, you have to, to choose the right medium for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, admit when you're licked. Admit whenever you know, you, you, you've been stumped. Um, don't just keep arguing or posting. Admit that you don't know how to continue the argument, and that's okay. And that's also a good time to, uh, to, to point somebody towards uh, another post or another, another website. Sometimes that can be helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the favorite, do it for the glory of God or don't do it at all. The greatest right. single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Um, and it's because 
we we kind of keep driving something home or we're trying to promote ourselves and that's yeah. uh, that's not what that's not what we're about so uh, all good stuff we we hope that uh that anybody may have been listening over there in the uh, the USCCB office um probably not you know cuz well um but uh but yeah just some extra some extra stuff there hopefully that's helpful what we're going to do now is move to our picks of the week <laughs> For our first CU pick of the week, we go over to Father Ryan Humphreys, who's uh in his house. <laughs> yes, 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 he is. <laughs> As it would happen. <laughs> That's where he usually is. So I have a book that Father Chris is going to love. Um, it is called and, and it, it has a, it's a it's not blasphemous in any way, shape, or form, but it uses a a, a, a little bit of a religious notion. Thou shalt not use comic sans. I like it already. Oh yeah, that's all you need to know. Thou shall not use Comic Sans. <laughs> For anyone who does any graphic design, you know that Comic Sans is the bane of all evil. It's basically the Lucifer of fonts. Uh, it's been so <laughs> overused. Uh, every time you employ it, bad things happen. You know, it's it's like Rosemary's Baby or Carrie. You just don't want to be involved with it. <laughs> or and Damien so um, this book has, it, it really is like a list of, I don't know, um, it's several hundred. I think it's 365, but I'm not sure. Basically, just little blurbs, almanac style, one blurb a day that lets you go through and learn a little bit about graphic design. And it covers a lot of different categories. Um, the book, for example, has an entire section on type and typography. You know, what are our fonts and how does that work? It has a section on layout and design, on color, on imagery and graphics, on production and print, and then also on practice of design that, that does things like you know, thou shall not automatically turn to design annuals or magazines for creative inspiration. And thou shall not rely solely on Google for research. Um, you know, things that are that are really helpful. You're not going to become a professional designer reading this book. But if you if you have some talent or even if you have a lot of talent, this is a worthy book to have. Uh, it's only 20 bucks. It is available on Amazon. Please buy it through our link in the show notes, though. Because then they'll give us a million dollars, or at least <laughs> or, some, or money something for, like like that. I, I'm all over it. In or fact, uh, eight I'm, pennies. Yeah. I'm buying it now. <laughs> Good for you, there, Father Chris. It, would it but be it's it's would it ahead. be worth it for me to get it on Kindle? Because I know they have a Kindle edition, but is, are there graphics in it? Uh, I don't have the Kindle edition. I have a PDF of the book. Okay, I was going to say, are there, if there are graphics in it, I won't get the Kindle edition because they don't usually render graphics all that well on my uh, e ink Kindle. Well, this is the kind of book that that you want to have on your uh, on your side table uh, just people okay. coming in waiting for you yeah because it's a hardbound book it's attractive and um hopefully some people will see this and realize you don't you do not have to use curls on every uh youth ministry um <laughs> book or ever or poster. ever you don't have for to any use reason it ever. you don't ever have to use curls but but you really don't have to use it on every flyer you make for your youth ministry That's i right. promise it it won't go wrong if you don't use curls it's okay very good. Mm, I like that. I'm gonna. Have, yeah, I'm, I'm ordering it right away. Uh, my pick of the week is uh, is something that actually I have on my person. Um, uh, of course, as you know, I uh, I have a devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, as as many of us do, many priests especially. And there was a uh, a promise made. Um, you know, uh, Saint Margaret Mary Alla Coke made to the Lord that she would she would keep on her person uh, an image of the Sacred Heart. And uh, so the Sacred Heart badge was was born. And um, it, it has become uh, quite uh, quite an, a, a part of devotion. And so I have my little Sacred Heart badge here that, that I usually just place right in my priestly pocket. And uh, this, is, this is a Sacred Heart badge that is so well made. It's embroidered. Uh, the, the image itself is embroidered. And then it's got an embroidery on the outside, or, you know, like some stitching. And uh, it's suitable for ironing on something or if you want to pin it on. It's not like the little paper ones that are in plastic, encased in plastic. And they are available on Autumn's website. If you go to autumn, uh, autumn.com, um, you can get them. Uh, they are 49 cents each. Um, so it's, it's cheap, but of course you have to buy a whole little box of them. So you get 48 in a box. And so for like 23 bucks, you get uh, 48 of these Sacred Heart badges that you can keep or give to others and spread the devotion to the Sacred Heart. So, uh, so. That's my pick of the week. I'm very, very excited about it because I've been on the lookout for a long time for, uh, for a Sacred Heart badge that, that is nice. Um, in 1870, a Roman lady wishing to know the opinion 
of Pope Pius IX about the badge of the Sacred Heart of Jesus presented him with one. Touched by the sight of the emblem of salvation, the Pope approved the devotion forever and said, this, madam, is an inspiration from heaven. Yes, from heaven. And then after a, a little while, he, he then said, I'm going to bless this Sacred Heart uh, or this Sacred Heart badge, and I want all badges that are made after this model um, to have the same blessing so that in the future it won't be necessary for the blessing to be renewed by a priest. And I want Satan to be unable to cause any harm to those who wear this badge, symbol of the adorable heart of Jesus. So, so I've got mine. Got mine right here. That's my pick of the week. All right. Well, sure. if, you've got a, if you've got a pick of the week, let us know. Backchat at catholicunderground.com. Father, do we have an Audible plug for, for You this know day? we do. <laughs> We'd like to thank audible.com for their sponsorship of the Catholic Underground. Uh, Audible is the world's leading supplier of audio books and spoken word digital audio. If you surf over to audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground, uh, you're going to get the opportunity to sign up for a 14-day trial membership, and a, you'll get with that a free book download. Uh, you can cancel at any time, and you get to keep the book, uh, and also you get to keep some of the membership uh, benefits. Now, membership offers you one or two audiobooks every month. It uh, gives you access to tons of free and discounted material, books, magazines, speeches. Uh, some of Pope John Paul II's sermons are there. Uh, even daily newspapers like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Uh, don't let your time behind the wheel or the stove or in the gym or wherever be wasted. And this week I want to recommend one we've recommended before, but it's been a sheen-heavy podcast, and so uh, we'll recommend the book Father Chris is reading right now, Treasure in Clay, the excellent autobiography of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Uh, it's, it's worth reading. It's worth listening to. Uh, so check out audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground and help us help you. <laughs> help yourself, right? <laughs> With helping. That's right. Well, that's it for us this week. For links and notes that we mentioned in the show and our picks of the week, and you can follow us on Twitter. Do all of this by visiting catholicunderground.com. You'll also find all of our new media projects that we're working on. Catholicunderground.com. Make yourself heard. Also there, backchat to catholicunderground.com. All righty. Joining us, you got Father Ryan Humphreys. His church is online. The whole thing. Can't be catholicchurch.com. He's at <laughs> FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. It's been my privilege, Father. Thank you. Josh LeBlanc hopefully will be back soon. He is out this week. He's got, uh, you know, deacony preparation-y things to do preparation d we'll call it <laughs> you know me i'm father chris decker you can follow me on twitter at digital catholic thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us on this digital continent we are catholic underground and we are faith on digital see you next time